Alright, All right, we're ready. Thank you so much. I'm happy to have this opportunity. And I don't know how many of y'all have been to Texas, but it's much warmer there. But uh, amazingly, with all the diversity on our team, none of us have been to Memphis. So we're very excited to be here. And we're excited about CBI. It's been an exciting company to study, especially with the acquisition of Shaw Pending. We recommend a buy, and our team from Texas A&M Corpus Christi will tell you more of the details. But our argument stems around four main points. First, the sheer size and growth opportunity in the market. Second, the unique synergies between the segments. Third, they've got some ability to diversify their risk. And fourth, their very strong leadership. We'll go over our detailed valuation with you. Uh, our, our price target was 64.98, which is a 52% upside potential from the end of last year, or from closing price on Friday, about 30% upside. The first place we see value is in the market itself. There's tremendous growth opportunity. Energy demand globally is forecast to grow over 33% by 2035, and electricity demand is expected to increase 70% due to emerging markets. A value that's been put on infrastructure spending globally is $70 trillion, the majority of that being in energy infrastructure, and engineering and construction has been identified as the most beneficial industry in the short term to take advantage of that. And we see that in the growth forecast where last year just 3.9% growth was seen in engineering and construction. Going forward, almost 30% is forecast by 2016, a 5% compounded annual growth rate. And CBNI is especially well positioned to take advantage of this with the acquisition of Shaw because now they have a very balanced global footprint. They also have a leading position in two very, very strong industries in hydrocarbons and in nuclear. But it's not just those individual industries, it's the unique mix of their segments that give them strength, and Chow will tell you more about that. Synergy gained from the SOAR acquisition have strengthened CBNI competitive advantage, shifting CBNI to a more competitive position in the power and energy infrastructure industry. Our team chose these synergies in terms of capabilities and sustainability. From the aspect of capabilities, these acquisitions bring into first the significant, I'm sorry, the uh, complementary business sector. Second is the new range of services, and third, um, increased resources that allow CBNI to strengthen its capabilities as well as be well prepared to capture the opportunities in the power and en engineer infrastructure industry. From the aspect of sustainability, these uh, strategic moves offer first is a significant backlog, total $26.6 billion, almost triple CBNI current backlog. Second, in new customer sector, especially the government sector. And third is the strengthened competitive positioning against its peer. Major peer players include Bechtel, Floor, KPI, Jacob Engineering. Looking at the chart, and you see that CBNI has the highest EPA growth and lowest PEG ratio, indicating an attractive stock for investors. And for profitability, the highest ROE means CBNI is able to generate more profits than its peer. Therefore, it is optimistic that this acquisition could be accurate to CBNI share earning. With this synergy, CBNI is better to have approximately $115 million increase in revenue, and this synergy even helps diversify some macroeconomic risks that Rodney will have elaborate more. As stated, CBNI will be able to diversify the risk. As with a lot of acquisitions, there's a lot of risk and a lot of opportunity to take advantage of this risk. What are the opportunities with nuclear? See, Shaw has two projects currently out, about $7.2 billion in the backlog. These two products stem from two permits, which the first two permits issued in the United States since 1978. The risk, though, is the U.S. Court of Appeals has stopped issuing permits due to the solid nuclear waste. CBNI is able to capitalize off this because of the ability to actually create the structures to contain the solid nuclear waste and to support the nuclear industry. Another opportunity is going to be a green industry. Green industry has actually grown over the past couple of years and it's continually growing. The risk though, this can hurt the hydrocarbon industry of the CBNI. However, CBNI can take advantage of this through, through the acquisition of Shaw, they gain hydroelectric and the environmental protection services, giving them a foothold in the green industry, allowing them to take advantage of green opportunities. Liquid natural gas is another opportunity presented to CBNI. 
Natural gas reserves have been found all across the United States, driving natural gas prices down and investment up. However, a report called the NEMA report came out stating that natural gas would be a net benefit if it's exported to the United States. This could cause natural gas prices to go up and investment to go down. However, CBNI is prepared for this and they can take advantage of it by creating the specialized structures to house liquid natural gas and before it's exported overseas. CBNI is able to do this through the strong leadership and their strong history of acquisitions in the past, is which what David is going to speak to you about. CBNI has pursued growth through strategic acquisition within the last decade. Uh, this has permitted the company to expand their portfolio of services and capitalize on the engineering integration. In 2000, they acquired Home International LLC for $145 million, and in 2003, they acquired John Brown Hydrocarbons. This led to an increase in EBITDA of 41.2 compound annual growth rate. By 2007, they acquired Lumos Technology. This uh, permitted the company to increase a little bit their margins of profitability, and it led to an increase of EBITDA of 18.3 compound annual growth rate. The last benchmark was done in 2012 consensus and it led to an increase of EBITDA of 15.8 compound annual growth rate. It's important to say that uh, CBI has been very careful with this acquisition of Shaw. They set up a team of 24 people to do external and internal due diligence and is persistent, persistent with the three acquisitions that I just talked about. Now, what, I, what I'm about to explain to you is expected to happen after the acquisition, okay? So cost savings, similar cost savings of $55 million, 115.3 uh, increase in EBITDA. CBI is expected to have 50,000 employees, which is the highest uh, in the industry. With the lack of uh, technical expertise, this creates a competitive uh, advantage within the company. 3,000 engineers, 1.2 project management. Now, tenure of senior management, top four executives, and CEO are above industry average, as well as number of employees and a CEO compensation is lower than the industry average, which has a positive impact in the financials. After do, done some technical and fundamental analysis, we have come to the conclusion that it's a strong buy, and JD will speak more about it. <coughs> to calculate the sales forecast for CBI, we use the percentage of sales technique to estimate the income for the next five years and then we use that income, uh, projected income statement to find the free cash flows to the company. Shaw's, CBI and Shaw are expected to realize, as David was saying, $115 bil uh, million in EBITDA from revenue synergies created by the acquisition, as well as $55 million in cost savings. We took both of these uh, into account in doing our valuation. We use two primary methods in evaluating CBI discounted cash flows, and a multiples analysis. We believe that these two methods are accurately capture both the historical performance of these companies as well as their potential as a synergetic whole. In doing our discounted cash flows, we used a 7% growth rate for CBI and a 3% growth rate for Shaw. We came up, we came up with these growth rates by using uh, doing a segment-by-segment -segment analysis of each of the companies, looking at the past three years to account for recessionary pressures, and also taking guidance from industry analysts. Arriving at our cost of equity, we used a risk-free rate of 4.0, which was a normalized 20-year rate to account for the current abnormally low risk-free rate, a risk premium of 5.5, and a beta of 1.65 to arrive at our cost of equity of 13.08. Putting this into our model, that gave us a price using the DCF model of $49.33 for CBI. In doing our multiples analysis, we examined the price-to-earnings ratio for CBI and for Shaw for the for both companies over the past three years. We came up with averages of 13.3 for CBI and 20.6 for Shaw. And taking into account future, future earnings potential, we came up with a weighted model of 16.3 price to earnings ratio for the combined company. Taking into account future earnings potential, that gives us a $77.01 price using the multiples analysis. And coming up with our final fair price, we, we looked at both models and we weighed them 60-40. 60 to account for the positive outlook and 40 to account for this history of continued growth and uh, stability. We came up with a 64 at 98 final price. Basically, we feel that the positive outlook and continued growth of uh, the company post acquisition uh, is a strong buy recommendation and mitigates any uh, concerns we might have and CBI is worth your attention. Thank you. Versus 
inflation already 3%, so essentially this company is getting 1% earnings per year. I mean, that's astoundingly low. Uh, if I would look at, at shares like that, I would sell them today. Um, so how can you explain that? I mean, that you have a strong buy, buy recommendation for astoundingly anemic earnings. Right, well, the earnings per share we did also takes into account uh, since 2009, we didn't want to do too early to account for recessionary pressure. Uh, also, there was the kind of cyclic nature of the industry. Shaw's EPS kind of caused, it caused us some problems, so we tried to normalize their earnings per share. So the, the earnings per share of four point of uh, the four percent that you're seeing includes. Um, it probably wasn't clear from the slide, but it also includes uh, 2008 through the forecast years, which is why it's kind of low. And if you look at a segment like Loomis, they've had over 7% growth. And so if you look at some of the unique occurrences that have happened with the economy here recently, that lower those numbers when you look at historical, but you look at some of the benefits that segments like Loomis has been able to have, you know, I think there's a more optimistic outlook than the historical analysis shows, which is why we're waiting for more. So, so what is the EPS growth just for the forecast period? If you use 2013, 2012, that's the case. Um, I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but it is between, I believe, 7 and 8% EPS growth. Yes. Are you expecting that the capital structure will change after the acquisition or business combination? And if that's so, would you try to calculate the cost of debt? Because you show cost of equity here. But uh, as David was mentioning earlier, CBI has a strong history of acquisitions. Um, they seem to only take on debt for the purposes of diversifying their company, as we saw with Loomis, uh, as we saw with Brown and the other acquisitions. So they seem to use debt more as a tool rather than uh, to build their company. So we didn't, when we were doing our analysis, we, we did take debt into consideration, but we also took CBI's uh, record of transformational uh, acquisitions and. It, you know, saying that debt wasn't a major consideration in our evaluation because CBI has such a good track record of taking companies, incorporating them into their portfolio, and then exploiting them to create synergies. And another factor of all companies, do you think that based on the factors of all, do you think that possibly, uh, uh, possibly uh, make sure that CBI can manage that debt over, over five, uh, three or four years based on what they need to develop us before? Going back to Brown's question here, um, we're seeing 4% EPS growth, however you want to normalize it, with maybe a 5% top line growth in revenue. Why isn't more, why aren't you seeing more operational synergies drop down to the bottom line? The company's getting bigger, uh, they, they're hopefully taking out some cost with, with these acquisitions. Why aren't we seeing greater operational synergies? We, we try to be as conservative as, as, as we could, and also, although we see a lot of synergies in the culture and expanding their human resources and so on, uh, we all of us know about the fiscal relief and all of us know about the situation in the United States. And although they are growing, they did 700 projects in 70 different countries, uh, we, we, we want to be as conservative as we could. There's still some real risk out there in the market. We are talking about the risk in the market. Did you try to do any risk analysis and, and uh, what management will do about managing the uh, additional risk of the risk combination? We did do a risk analysis and the three risks that were talked about of uh, what might happen with nuclear, liquid natural gas, and with the green energy was kind of the top risk that we wanted to talk about within the presentation given the 10 minute time limit. Uh, the reason why we picked these risk was because the nuclear technology, there has been some concern over the Shaw acquisition of the two, of Shaw's handling of the two contracts that they have given. However, with CBI, the due diligence and the strong leadership, we believe that they will be able to come in and help fix that and get that back onto schedule. With the green energy hurting the hydrocarbon business, considering that a lot of hydrocarbon is with CBI's core business, we see that the environmental protection services, especially with uh, what Shaw did with Katrina, and how they were able to get that and knock that out within a couple, within uh, a time frame that they were actually months early. And the fact they have the hydroelectric power, that's with that diversification of the business, they can actually alleviate that risk. But the liquid natural gas, the ability of the still structures to build those those terminals and those 
facilities in order to help with that exporting, especially if exporting does go the way that they say it's going to go, with all the United States exporting a lot of liquid natural gas overseas to create that, create that fund, create that benefit, CP9 is going to be able to step up and actually be right there creating these terminals and these facilities in order to help accommodate that and help gain revenue and gain profit from those. Another real risk that a company is always facing acquisitions is the culture, right? And as we looked at that, we talked to the CEO on a conference call we were able to have, and these cultures are very complementary. And so you look at something like Sprint and Nextel, you know, they, they look good on paper, but it just never came together. Um, listening to them talk and seeing what they've done, you know, it's very confident that they'll be able to do this and make it work. That is a, a huge opportunity because uh, the deployment operationally speaking with 50,000 employees is great. And based on, on our research, research has shown that they are very flexible, full of, of, of employees. Speaking of employees and synergy management, do you see any synergy management after business combination or who is going to dominate in terms of corporate governance structure of the company? We, we expect CBI's you know, proven track record of doing acquisitions, making them synergetic, making them, transforming them and incorporating them into, into their portfolio. We expect CBI to be no different in this case. So we, we're, we're going to see CBI's you know, experience management, as Dave was saying, come in and do what they need to do to make whatever um, they need to do to make this successful. Um, they were saying on a call with the analysts that we found on their website that it does, um, the CEO said it doesn't matter what Shaw did in the past. What matters now is that we're going to come we're going to make, do whatever we have to do to make this acquisition work and make it profitable for And some of the cost savings that are happening right away are from the Shaw management exit. Exactly. So and they expect to change the company overnight as well. And if you look at the, uh, their their junior for senior management, top four executives, and CEO, company, and, and the CEO that are involved in the three hours, so they have a very strong leadership. I believe that Mr. Asherman or Mr. Patterson are the stars in the company. Okay, so you said <coughs> that right now the CEO is not compensated as highly as the industry. As the industry. Once he starts having more people under him, do you see these costs going up? Uh, I would say no, based on my research and what I have research about the bio of Mr. Asherman. Mr. Asherman actually was the CEO from floor and he, I think he's in the, in the company because he believes what he's doing and, and with growth I think with the stock options are going to get the, the compensation will be based on growth instead of just getting a hit in the compensation. Are all these acquisitions just put lipstick on the table because you're doing acquisitions, serial acquire, trying to compensate for what you wrote. So how do you, how do you, uh, you know, we've seen that in a lot of other industries. I would say no. I mean, I think the, some of the, especially if you look at this acquisition, it's been highly beneficial for them. It's not only added a significant amount of operational income, it's also provided more steady growth because it's based on patents and process technology. So where their core business is this project related, maybe the economy goes up or down and there's more variation, you get something like Loomis and it really adds steady. Same thing with Shaw, with the environmental and infrastructure services and some of the fabrication and maintenance. Much more complementary. Fabrication and maintenance alone is supposed to have three to five percent on each project because that's something that CBNI has to outsource now, sometimes to Shaw. So this acquisition helps it with that full downstream benefit kind of from start to finish of projects. And also I would like to highlight the, the discipline that CBI has invested mm -hmm. on this process. It's definitely something that uh, we should look into. And uh, it's all about, uh, CBI has been very good at, at, at making a timely manner developing the projects and, and meeting the, the goals of their company. So as I said, they set up a team of 24 people to do internal and external at the diligence and it's persistent what they have done before. So I definitely think that is a good thing. And they are trying to acquire horizontal integrity. They even turn down projects that are in their group that aren't value added. So for example, with the steel plate structures, they're not interested in tank farm projects. What they're interested is in LNG with cryogenics and the value add that comes from LNG export terminals and storage. So I would say it's not just an acquisition to look good, and put lipstick on a pig, it's really adding value. Okay, so one great question, one for the two of you growth rate that you use from the DCM. I'm sorry? What for the two of you growth rate that you use? We actually did a DCF analysis separately. We did 7% for CBI and 3% for, um, for Shaw. So we did 
the analysis separately, and then when we combined them, we took, like I said before, the synergies into effect when we were doing our calculus for the CBI shawl, those kinds of composition. And the weights. 60, 60, 60, 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 